Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk about drone control or controlling a drone using Rust. My name is Lechezar Lechev. I know it's hard to pronounce or remember, so don't worry if you get it wrong or forget it. I'm from Bulgaria, and I'm currently working at Adex during the day. I'm using Rust for the last one and a half years. Yay, and it's full-time job. So this was my dream only two years ago, and I finally achieved it. <laughs> Our work is centered around the Ethereum network uh, blockchain, uh, Ethereum blockchain at the moment, and we are building a display ad network for reduced ad fraud and increased user privacy. At night, however, I play around the IRO Rust working group that we have started at the beginning of this year. And the goal is to help and push the open source community uh, to the growing, uh, into the growing aerospace industry by providing information, materials, tools, uh, crates, and etc., to the industry itself and to hobbyists, of course. One of the main reasons uh, that I wanted to start this working group uh, was in fact that I couldn't find enough information at a reasonable level that I can understand. At my job and at the working group, I make and build open source projects. I love to travel a lot and combi combined with the fact that I'm location independent, it's awesome. Uh, however, due to uh, the current outbreak, uh, traveling is not a certain thing anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, combined with traveling, um, I love to go to festivals and parties. I especially like trance music. After, after all, we have to blow off some steam somehow from time to time, uh, apart from being uh, software engineers and developers. As you can also see, I'm a heavy user of emojis as well. They're part of me and I just like it. <laughs> Today, we're going to take a look at the Parrot Anafi 4K drone. The company Parrot makes a bunch of drones. Uh, some of them fly, some of them don't. Initially, when the whole project started, uh, Ignition, one of the other co-founders of Aerorust, uh, started hacking on a different drone. It is called the Jumping Zoom, and it's a remote-controlled two-wheeler that can also jump. However, we, as in I, thought it would be awesome if we make it work for the flying drones and try to control them. The picture you see here is one of the packages that, that the Parrot company has uh, of the Anafi 4K drone. It includes the Sky Controller as well that you can use to control the drone. It is good time to mention that none of this is sponsored by them in any means, at least not for now. <laughs> uh, it is an accessible small drone, uh, especially uh, because of the price and it's easy to work with. And why did we choose it in the first place? Well, we chose it because it has a lot of features, including uh, Wi-Fi over which you control the drone. Uh, the drone has its own network that you can connect to. It has a 4K camera and the Parrot company provides a CSDK uh, to be used for the drones. It's open sourced and it's the main way we find many of the things uh, that we need in order to hack on the drone using Rust. The company provides other SDKs as well for building Android and iOS apps. Uh, they also include a uh, Python uh, version, but uh, it's using the CSDK. And that's where the other SDK, PyParrot, comes into play. Um, PyParrot is a Python SDK, and it's very, very helpful uh, when things don't work and you wonder why. The, 
there is a simulation tool called Sphinx. It has many features that I have haven't reviewed or used yet. However, since I don't actually own an Anafi 4K drone, it's uh, very useful to play around with it and build the Rust SDK with it. There is also the free flight app, uh, which uh, is for iOS and Android, that gives you the ability to connect to any para drone, and you can use it even for the simulation. I tried it one day, uh, but that's not we are, what we are here for. We want to use Rust to control it. <laughs> there is the Sky controller uh, that I already mentioned, and the list of features goes on. Now that we know what we are working with, it's time to take a look at how does it work. The main point, you know, the, the, uh, it all has to do actually with communication. And the way we communicate uh, with the drone is over Wi-Fi, the same way as the apps and the Sky, Sky Controller. The Sky Controller is a to your phone. It has its own separate Wi-Fi antennas and stuff. And I think that the phone is used for the video stream itself instead of on controlling the, uh, the drone. And regarding the connection and the communication, we need to talk about three main points. The first one is the handshake. After connecting to the Wi-Fi of the drone, uh, we need to establish communication between our controller, that is our program, and the drone. The pirate drones use their own protocol uh, that we are going to take a look at. It includes different mechanisms and things that we are still finding out how to work with. And the protocol uses what we call frames. And we will see what they look like and represent in a bit. This is all incorporated in the AR SDK ARS crate, which is in heavy development state right now, aka work in progress. And now let's start with the handshake. After we have connected to the drone over uh, Wi-Fi, we need to establish the connection between our program, aka the controller, and the drone. Each drone has its own initial port. It's usually 44444. And we use TCP and make sure that uh, we handle the handshake correctly, especially the response from the drone. Through the established TCP connection, uh, we send the request, which is serialized uh, with uh, Serde and Serde JSON into a JSON string. It includes the D2C port, which means drone to controller port, alongside the controller name and type, which I'm not really sure how the drone uses. And there are other ports for the video streams, uh, which I haven't bothered to check yet. After sending the request, uh, we should we should get a response in JSON, uh, which we deserialize again with Selde and Selde JSON. We get a controller to drone port from the drone and its response, uh, which is basically how the uh, controller will speak to the drone. It also includes a status field, and if the status field is zero, then we have a connection. Otherwise, we need to try the handshake again. 
The response provides other fields as well uh, regarding other options, ports, etc. Uh, we we currently don't use them, and honestly, at this point, uh, I don't know what they are for yet. And by this, we have a connection. Hooray! <laughs> And to get a visual representation of uh, what I just explained, uh, I've included the request logs here that you can see. And we use the same 44444 port to connect the drone and send the request to the drone, as well as the field uh, we sent to it. And finally, we have the successful response from the drone. Again, uh, you can see the controller to drone port and the status fields, as well as the other uh, fields that the drone sends. And now that we have this connection with the drone established, it's time to talk about the protocol. The protocol uh, uses what we call frames. And the first part of the protocol is the ping pong frames slash mechanism. Then uh, we have the listener that listens to the provided drone to controller port for incoming from the drone messages and frames and deserializes them. Then, finally, we have the command sender, which we will use uh, to send frames to control the drone. The ping pong frames and mechanism in a nutshell means that the drone sends us a pink frame with some gibberish data, uh, which I actually found out a couple of days ago. Uh, before that, I thought uh, it also combines an actual frame. However, this is not the case. It's just gibberish. And the drone expects a response of that pink frame called punk, which we will see how it works when we talk about the frames themselves. The punk frame should contain the same data, the same gibberish data that was received from the ping. And if we don't send any punk response in seven seconds, the drone usually disconnects the controller, as in our program, and we need to do the whole handshake again. The listener at this point uh, does some basic stuff which are crucial to the communication, the connection itself, and the bugging and so on. It uses a UDP socket with the controller to drone port that was provided by the drone during the handshake. And each received message can contain more than one frame. And we will see how we cope with this and extract each frame from the message. The listener also deserializes uh, all known and unknown frames. Since it's still work in progress, uh, not all frame deserialization is implemented. And this gives us an easy way to gradually decode each frame either by using the C or the PyPirate SDKs and looking into them and trying to understand what each byte means. At this point, the listener is handling pink responses by sending a new punk frame to the command sender so that it can also be sent to the drone as well as the so-called acknowledge frames, which we'll get to in, uh, to, in, to in a bit, which we'll get to it in a bit. I've also included some logs from the listener uh, to better understand what, what's happening. 
as we can see, uh, we receive some bytes from the drone, and then we see the deserialized version of the parsed bytes. Uh, yeah, uh, we are going to take a look at uh, each individual element in a bit. On the other hand, the command sender handles the sending of frames from our program to the drone. It uses UDP socket as well, and we expect it to send frames from the controller to the drone on the drone to controller port. Uh, this is the same port that we have provided on the request when making the handshake. Right now, it sends the raw bytes to the drone. Uh, the actual serialization is uh, happening on a different place. And the logging, again, it's uh, straightforward. Uh, this example is for the takeoff frame, which will tell the Anafi 4K drone to how to magically take off and hover above the ground waiting for further frames and commands. The earlier logs that we saw from the listener were actually the acknowledge response from the drone uh, for the takeoff frame uh, that we saw in the previous slide. Basically, it, it is saying that it received the frame and executed it. In order to fully understand and yeah, know what each thing means, we need to take at the frames. And as we mentioned before, we can receive more than one frame from the drone. And the way we distinguish between every frame, like shown here, is the way the frame and its bytes are arranged. I've personally found that it's easier to understand the frame by representing the bytes as a U8 or a unsigned 8-bit numbers. And this message uh, can roughly be translated to this. The first frame uh, we have, we can decode, uh, has a type data, which means that it's a frame containing some data. The buffer ID uh, is pink, and following the buffer ID, uh, we have the sequence ID. This sequence ID is based on each individual buffer ID, and it starts from zero. When the count gets to the limit of U8, it overflows and starts from zero again. This way, uh, we can send an acknowledge frame to confirm to the drone uh, that we've received a specific frame. But we can also make sure that the drone returns an acknowledge frame that guarantees us that a command we sent is executed. For example, we might want to know if the drone has actually landed and executed the landing command. Otherwise, it can still hover over the surface. The next four bytes, uh, or uh, U32 in a nutshell, is the length of the full frame. It is serialized using a little Indian or the less, less significant byte first. The length includes the headers, uh, type, buffer, sequence ID, each uh, represented by one byte. The U32 that the length represents, this is four bytes. And the feature length of the frame if there is one. And by this length, uh, we can split each and every uh, individual frame if we have received more than one. In similar matter, uh, we can uh, decode the second frame and uh, as in the first one. And uh, the type here uh, is data with acknowledge. 
which means that the drone requires us to send and acknowledge for this frame, meaning that uh, we need to confirm that we have received it. Uh, then we have uh, the buffer ID uh, DC event, which means drone to controller event. And this is an, an event uh, that the drone sends us uh, to notify us about something happening. In this case, uh, it's sending us a calibration state that the drone is into. And as we saw in the previous slide, uh, the message uh, had 35 bytes. And we can see that the length of the first frame is 23, and the length of the second one is 12, which is a total of 35 bytes. And with the current implementa implemented uh, types, uh, this looks like so. Um, to elaborate a bit on the whole buffer ID and sequence ID, uh, you can see that the pink frame has a sequence ID 1, and the DC event ha also has a sequence ID of 1. Each buffer ID has its own counter. The next time we receive a pink frame, it should be with a sequence of two. The same goes for the frames that we are sending. As you can also see, not all types are currently implemented and defined. And although the pink uh, in the pink frame, we see uh, that the feature is unknown. Uh, and uh, with the value of three, uh, this is not used since it's part of the gibberish data of pink and not an actual feature value. Now, let's take a look at the type and the buffer ID. Uh, the type basically means that uh, what type of frame we have, what kind, as we can see, we have acknowledge, data. Uh, most of them are easy to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to understand, uh, but some of them we still don't know how to use or uh, yeah, we haven't looked at them. On the other side, uh, we see the buffer ID. Uh, they are usually separated in two distinct categories, from the drone to the controller, they are usually prefixed with DC, uh, not all. Uh, the pink and the acknowledge from sent with acknowledge, the last one, uh, they are not prefixed yet. <laughs> and uh, we can see that the punk is not, also not uh, prefixed and it's part of the controller to drone buffer IDs. Uh, these are uh, the buffer IDs that we're going to use to send frames to the uh, drone. And we already saw the DC event in action uh, when we took a look at the calibration state example from the previous slide. Now that we know at least what the headers do and how what the, the frame looks like and represents. Uh, it's now time to take a look at the frame itself and build a whole frame, which we can use to send to the drone. <laughs> the frame struct is pretty simple and straightforward. The bulk of the work, however, is in the features. Those features represent each and every command, event, setting, state, etc., that the drone understands. Some features uh, include only simple values that we saw in the previous example. Uh, some of the features include C strings and special parsing, like, for example, the uh, setting the date and type and time of the drone. Even the frame for sending piloting commands to the drone includes a timestamp. Uh, that is specially encoded, that is uh, 
in a specific format, let's say. And we need to parse it for both serialization and deserialization. It is important to mention, though, uh, that when we are serializing the frame, we serialize the feature first of the frame. And then we can calculate the total length of the frame in bytes. When we have the total length, we can encode it at the right bytes uh, in order for the frame to be fully ready to uh, be sent to the drone. As we saw in the uh, messages example, uh, it's usually like the third byte to the seven or something like that. For the actual serialization and the serialization of the frames, uh, we are using the crate scroll. This means that for each struct or enum, uh, we have to implement try into context and try from context, which gives us the ability to serialize and deserialize the bytes, as we saw earlier. This does require a lot of research and boilerplate at this point in order to map every single feature that we can have. And this is why yeah, we still have a lot to implement and track down in order to finish the whole serialization and deserialization of frames. Now, I was going to show you a GIF of a working example. However, let's see how the gods of live demo, uh, if they're yeah, going to allow me to show it live to you instead of uh, uh, actual GIF. So first we need to start the Sphinx uh, tool. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty simple command. Uh, they, it does steal your Wi-Fi card uh, because it needs to create the same Wi-Fi as in the drone. It uses the same uh, firmware as the drone and it also includes this uh, .drone file that has some settings you can tweak and uh, the 3D model and stuff like that. Now, when we started, uh, when we started, uh, it's going to give us this gazebo UI, and we can see the drone right here in the middle. Maybe I can, yeah. And if I Rotate it, we can see the camera here. So it's pointing at the back right now. For reference, we can insert uh, a 3D model of some building, an apartment building. And usually there is a video stream of the drone. However, because I don't have a dedicated GPU, uh, I'm not sure if it's going to work very well. It usually doesn't. <laughs> uh, it gets to the, yeah, to the initial view of the webcam, of the camera, actually. And then it doesn't, it doesn't update until the drone has landed. However, uh, let's try it and uh, see if it works. So we have the drone here. Uh, I have this example uh, for taking off with the drone. And I should take off, hover for a couple of seconds. Then it should fly up and down and land. As we can see here, uh, the logs that I showed earlier with all the frames and the actual drone now moving and accepting the commands we're sending. Uh, let's try the video. Nope, the video is broken, so I'll just close it. And we can see that we're currently sending the takedown command. And now we've just sent the landing command. And the drone has landed successfully. The drone is still, we're still keeping the connection with the drone and it's still sending some information 
uh, although it has landed and we can still uh, start it up again very easily if we send another um, takeoff command. And thankfully this worked, yay. <laughs> Demo time, yes. Oops. This is uh, still work in progress, uh, pretty much. And we have a long, long way to go. However, it was really fun to build this and uh, we are exploring uh, new things that we can make and do with the drone. I've been in contact, for example, uh, with the Rust Computer Vision working group, and I hope we can make some post-processing of the video from the drone. We still have a lot of flying to do, especially to figure out uh, what is a good approach for the API uh, to make it easier more idiomatic to use and to control the drone and each aspect of the flying itself. There are, of course, much improvements. Um, it's just hacking at this point and trying to make things work. There are definitely improvements to be made, uh, especially separating the frames by a receiving frames and sending frames. Uh, to make it uh, more comfortable to work with them and uh, yeah, build the correct frames instead of sending something that the drone won't understand. And some of the other mechanisms that I haven't mentioned here, uh, especially around the flying and uh, yeah, sending the commands and receiving uh, outputs of, of them or confirmations. We still have a lot of implementations to do. All the features uh, and um, yeah, we need to be able to distinguish between the receiving and the sending uh, because uh, yeah, when we receive an unknown frame and we don't know how to handle it, uh, this can crash the drone and we should know all the correct values for that. I hope this whole experience is inspiring because uh, we had a lot of fun building it, uh, especially uh, thanks to Ignition who started the whole journey, uh, starting with the, the small jumping sumo and uh, then I just, hey, let's try the, the flying drone. We had a lot of frustration. Why does it work? What's broken? Why does it disconnect? However, uh, with enough time and uh, how to say it, uh, with enough, enough, uh, uh, yeah. When you when you want to do something, and you want it really hard, you can achieve it. It's just a matter of time. And this project is part of the Arrow Rust Working Group. Uh, you can find the SDK repository below as well as some other cool projects uh, we are working on in our GitHub repository and organization. I've provided some links to uh, some of the Parrot uh, tools, as well as the Rust Computer Vision uh, organization, if you're interested in that. And uh, thank you for your time. Oh, okay. Perfect. Oh, couple of slides. Sorry. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, uh, I'm open for questions, so please share them on whatever streaming portal you're uh, looking this at.
question on Twitch. RP Ruiz, sorry if I missed this at the beginning, but is this an OS project? Anyway, one can collaborate. Yes, the software is free and open source right now. And uh, I have provided you uh, in the last slide with the uh, actual repository that you can get involved in. Just jumping into the Discord server, ask questions. Uh, there are a lot of people there, especially people with backgrounds in whatever. They're aerospace engineers and material engineers. Uh, we have separate, uh, yeah, se separate groups of people uh, working on different projects in different areas. Okay, another question, YouTube. Uh, Zbigniew, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Zbigniew uh, Sitiart, uh, would it be possible to run Rust flight controller software di directly on the drone without the network round trip? Yeah, I haven't checked that. Uh, probably it might be uh, possible to flash some custom firmware on it, but uh, at this point uh, we're still playing with uh, Wi Fi. Question on Twitch. Exa Kage, uh, do you welcome contributors without much experience? Yes, we do. Uh, the whole point of the uh, IRO Rust community, uh, not only a working group, we are a whole community, is to share knowledge and information uh, uh, on various topics about IRO space and engineering and whatever space even. So it's definitely uh, yeah, encouraging to see new people coming in and trying to uh, bring them up to speed or try to help them find their place. Well, another questions? Maybe I can return the slides that we've missed. <laughs> YouTube, Boris, Kiran, is there interest in space industry to use Rust? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Uh, there is uh, quite a big interest right now, especially in the Rust community, as far as I know. Uh, on another conference on Oxidize, uh, they were talking about uh, how they want to bring uh, the Rust and to verify the compiler or at least part of it uh, to be used in uh, yeah in space because there are really tight uh, things that uh, they have like verification of the tools. Each tool must be verified that it does what it uh, it's meant to be in. Uh, and it's defined somehow. Question, YouTube. Michael Lazowski, have you tried to write it in other languages? For example, C or C++? Uh, no, I'm mainly working with Rust nowadays, uh, and I don't even know C and C++ a lot. However, the main SDK is actually in C, so it might be interesting to take a look at it. Okay. Uh, okay. So I need to pick somebody with the most interesting question. Uh, I definitely like questions about IROST because uh, the main idea is to share information. And although I don't know anything about drones or space, I can actually go somewhere and ask somebody and start preparing myself even for a career there. Uh, so in that case, I would like to OK, 
Okay, T Twitch, another question. Final question, okay. <laughs> Final Spartan. I want we need to have a compiler purely made from Rust before we can verify it. Uh, targeting LLVM would be heartache to ver verify. If I remember correctly, uh, we don't need pure uh, Rust compiler to do so. Uh, there are subsets of the C or C++ compilers that are verified, as far as I know. And so we can do the same thing for Rust, um, especially um, given that we now have two backends or frontends, uh, keep forgetting, with CraneLift. Uh, we can take a subset of Rust and try to verify it uh, bit by bit until uh, we can start using it in uh, space applications. And as I said, uh, I do like questions uh, regarding IROST. So I would say X say cage. I choose you. <laughs> Best question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, from Twitch. So thank you, everybody. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous talking in front of people. Uh, however, it was really fun, and I hope you uh, had some inspirational things that you found in my talk. Ah, bye-bye.